George, right? Is it the pronunciation right? George Caneiro. Welcome. He's a principal investigator here, uh, well, at the Gublenkian Institute of Science. So he's a very much a local. And uh, at the OERAS Associates Laboratory and uh, the Theoretical Immunology Group. And his group uses mathematical modeling to understand the development of the immune system and its regulation. And also lymphocyte signaling, differentiation, and commitment. Uh, like many other speakers, he is an inter interdisciplinary researcher, and uh, he went uh, through mathematical modeling of the immune system, and he was also uh, the vice president of the Portuguese Society of, Im of Immunology. And now he, he is going to talk about the emergence of self and others and other in collective systems from the vertebrate immune system to the distributed robotic systems thank you okay thank you so if anyone is curious the gulbenkian institute which is part of the gulbenkian foundation is 20 kilometers from here in the direction of cascais close to the ocean it's a quite a, a nice institute so what i'm going to try to do today which is going to be a bit uh, strange in the, in the in the community that is here, but I think it, in the end there will be connections. I'm going to try to, to make you understand how the immune system, so that's what we are seeing there, is half an hour of the life of lymphocytes inside of the spleen of a mouse, it can actually make a discrimination between self and non-self, and uh, how we are trying to implement those kind of immune systems into robotic systems, okay? So that's the agenda, and I hope I can reach that. And uh, I, just as a, to explain a little bit how this is going to be, so what you are seeing here is what I call the immunobarometer, and I guess most of the people in the audience would stay here. So you know what is a vaccine, you know what is an antibody, but if you don't go as deep as in there, sorry for this nasty thing, this would be a mat mathematical barometer, how far you would go from words like equation up to hybrid automata like we are using, which would be, just tells the difficulty of what I'm going to tell you. So what I'm going to do is actually closer to public understanding of science rather than science itself, and I apologize for that, but I hope to pass the message and then we can discuss. So if we think about the vertebrate, what's going on here? Okay, so what is supposed to, oh yeah, there it is. So what you are seeing here is bacteria dividing, so it's explosive in terms of speed as you compare to the development of a, a vertebrate like a human, okay? So you can have a lot of uh, generations and evolution inside, during the period in which an animal is developing, so consider the lifelong, how many generations you can do. So the vertebrate immune system is actually characteristics, well, of the vertebrate, and it's a particular innovation that comes from the possibility to actually reshuffle genes in the genome using a transposon that has been co-opted by some uh, early genome. And what is going on in there is that from hematopoietic stem cells, you generate a very vast repertoire of uh, lymphocytes, each one with a unique gene that's an that encodes an antigen receptor. And so therefore, although bacteria evolve very fast, this system also managed to cope with that by generating variants at a high speed and then selecting variants, expanding them, and that's what we call an immune response. Vaccination is the selective expansion of those variants that recognize bacteria or whatever you are injecting in a mouse, okay? Now, this proposes a problem because since this generation of diversity is done randomly, actually literally copy-pasting segments of DNA and encoding, adding and removing nucleotides, there is no way of predicting this. And in contrast to all the receptor uh, ligand pairs in the genome, this is actually a pair that is open-ended, okay? So you generate all sorts of receptors, so there is a potential to recognize all sorts of ligands, and that's advantageous to, to, that's what allows the immune system to cope with 
evolving bacteria. So if you think about what the vertebrate immune system does, so it fights infection, but also it, in, it uh, assimilates the intestinal flora. So you, we have a lot of bacteria in the gut, but the, the composition of the gut is influenced by the immune system. Okay, so that's one of the things that is being done there. So we also fight, the immune system also fights uh, tumors that appear in the, in the organism. It does a lot of housekeeping, so most of the cells that die will stimulate the immune system and will be seen by the immune system. And it does one thing that I find the most fascinating one, which is what we call homeostasis and regulation, is the immune system regulates itself, okay? And uh, this is very important, actually, because when it fails, you get all sorts of autoimmune diseases in which the, the lymphocytes are infiltrating different tissues and actually destroying the tissue, okay? And if you consider the mother of all the autoimmune disease is a single point mutation that only, uh, so, so in a gene in the X chromosome, so it only uh, it's fatal for males. But uh, what is happening there is just that you don't have one of the key molecules that is involved in regulating the immune system. I'm going to tell you a little bit more. And so these kids, they die within six months to one year. Now, if we consider autoimmune diseases, so this failure of the immune system to properly deal with the tissues. So we see the, the success story of uh, biomedical research, which is decreasing the, the infectious diseases during the uh, last century. But if we see what happens to the immunopathologies, like autoimmune diseases or allergy, they are increasing concomitantly. So, so there seems to be a relationship between the way the immune system deals with bacteria and the way the immune system deals with tissue components. Okay, and so basically the question that we are asking is how does a collective of cells that pretty much looks like moving around randomly, being very diverse and so on and interacting, can develop an identity such that there will be something like a collective self and something that we call another or non-self if you want. So that's, that will be to try to understand this is what I'm going to try to do. So one, one of the crucial uh, observations to understand the immune system is actually when you take an healthy individual like this that is not autoimmune, and you actually separate the lymphocytes into two, one population that if you transfer into an animal that has no, no immune system, so you just reconstitute the immune system partially with those cells, you generate an autoimmune disease. If you can't transfer the complementary population, you get an, an individual that will be tolerant, and depending on these proportions, that you transfer the mixtures of these cells, you can reconstitute a system that is either tolerant, so there is no autoimmunity, or full autoimmunity. And the kind of symptoms that these mice develop is very similar to what that kid will have, which is a massive infiltration of the tissues with, by lymphocytes and destruction of all the organs. Okay? Now, from the mathematical point of view, what we are looking at this is something like a bistable system that depending on the initial composition of the system will can go to one state or the other, and I'm going to illustrate this a little bit better. Let me call these cells regulatory cells because they prevent the effector cells to cause autoimmune diseases. Okay? And now, as a point for modeling, since we were discussing modeling before, so if we consider something like a tissue like the, the pancreas that is infiltrated by lymphocytes, immunologists will try to look at it from a molecular point of view. And so trying to find the components that will be changing the balance between cells in there, regulatory and effector cells. And by looking at this, I think it's very similar to when you actually take some, something like a machine, like a sewing machine that is, so everything goes wrong, but let's, let me try, if you are pretty, you are foreseeing it like the immune system, then we'll have another one. Okay. So then, if a machine fails in there, so the kind of approach that immunologists are trying to do is actually to try to get, so what you should see here is a catalog of uh, molecules. Okay. That a, a catalog of pieces of that thing. So in practice, what modeling, with the way we are understanding it, is actually doing, doing it like this. If you actually try to take a sewing machine, and yet that actually happened, to us at home, we, couldn't, we put it apart and then we could not put it together. So we looked for the catalog of the pieces and the components of the thing, and it ne we never managed to put it up together until we saw this cartoon that explains, explains the basic principles, the basic dynamics 
of the system. Okay? So what I'm proposing you is a mathematical model that has the same degree of simplicity. So I'm not going to show you equations, but I'm going to show you the actors, the way they interact, and then I'm showing you the results. So if you look at here, so you'll have antigen-presenting cells that are cells that are actually chewing up other cells and presenting the components of everything that is going on in your body to lymphocytes. So when we'll have two actors, so the effector cells, and what these cells do, they present them and then they catalyze their cell division. So if an immune response is nothing else than the a positive feedback loop of growth of these things driven by the antigen-presenting cell. Now, if we take the other counterpart, the regulatory cell, it also interacts and recognizes antigens in there, but it won't divide if it is just there alone. For this cell to give a population and to divide, then it has to interact simultaneously with an antigen-presenting cell and an infector cell that can actually cause an immune response. And in this scenario, this cell will divide and this one will be inhibited from dividing. And so this defines a positive and a feedback loop that will just determine our population dynamics. Okay, so we're going to show you this model at work. So this is basically the, what the equations that we write will give you. So we have the population, the log of the population of regulatory cells and the log of the population of effector cells. And here is the parameter that controls the population of antigen presenting cells. And then what you see is that you can have, depending on the initial composition, you can go either to one state over there or to another state. Okay? You know, as a function of the antigen presentation, so as a function of the antigens that these cells see in the body as they circulate, you will have this bifurcation here, where if you are down here, the system cannot sustain regulatory cells, so it will be just limited by antigen-presenting cells, and this is basically a system that will only go into an immune response or autoimmunity mode, and if you are in here, then you can actually be on the two states. So regulatory cells, to persist in the body, they need to recognize a population of antigen-presenting cells that is persistent and abundant. Okay, so meaning the body components. Now, if you look at this, it's a fairly, the reason I'm showing you the simulation is fairly nonlinear. So if you set the system in a situation of tolerance, like most of us, then you can have, actually, the system is quite robust. You can change the antigen presentation, like what it happens during infections, that you present more of your self-antigens and so on. But for example, if you have a massive increase in antigen presentation, then actually the system evolves to the other state and goes to autoimmunity. So this is basically the etiology of autoimmunity. You can see actually that depending on the way you face the infections and so on, infections can be beneficial by just making your tolerance more robust, or actually if they are acute and unpredictable, you can actually go to a state of autoimmunity, okay? Now, if you take this system and consider what happens if the antigen presentation is distributed in a very diverse population, you can break the thing into three regions, one in which all the cells go extinct, one in only effector cells stay, and one in which regulatory cells and effector cells stay. And so you actually make automatically a pattern where tolerance is made for very abundant antigens and the immunity or autoimmunities are done for rare uh, antigens. And so, for example, if you want to put that into a repertoire where we are allowing all the cells to evolve, divide, and uh, mutate, and so on, you would actually see this partitioning here. Now, so the, the model is telling you how the immune system would actually partition the repertoire in such a way that it's tolerant to body tissues that are persistent and abundant, but it could be have no regulatory cells allowing to mount immune responses for pathogens uh, that would invade your organism. Okay, before I pro progress, so, so that you have an idea, so I, I'm trying to avoid to talk about the way we are going at about testing this, but for example, we are using next, next generation sequencing to test these predictions about the repertoire of the immune system and so on. But in, from a theoretical point of view, one of the things that I would like to do is to understand the principles by which this works. And then I took a, an approach that is more Richard Feynman's one, which is what I cannot create, I do not understand. And so to do a little bit, some steps in that direction, we started thinking about designing artificial immune systems based on this cross-regulation model, where the idea is actually to try to see whether we can have a multi-agent system that is completely um, decentralized, 
and it can actually do what the immune system does, which is to create this meaning, create a self and another. And so, for example, some colleagues from Indiana have used this for uh, this model to actually create text mining and spam detection algorithms, which again, the spam, the problem of spam is very much like the antigenic world, which depends on your context. What is today for you spam can be no longer spam for you tomorrow. For example, in my, in my mail mailbox some 10 years ago, you would not have the word sperm, or if it would appear sperm, which would be most likely be spam from uh, some sexual harassment, uh, internet harassment thing. Now, for example, I'm working on chemotaxis of sperm and decision-making in the sperm in the sea urchin, and having the word, spam, uh, the word sperm is actually not at all spam, it's something that I'm very interested in. And so we, what we are interested in is trying to get context-dependent algorithms that are not predefining the categories of what is spam and what is not spam, a priori, like the immune system does. And so more recently, we started working actually in an even more fascinating problem, which is robot collectives. You know, robotics is evolving now to a stage where we are not thinking about the one robot that has been designed by an engineer to do fantastic things, but we have collectives of robots, swarms and so on, that go along and do the things, what they do in their life. Now, one of the big problems with this kind of uh, robotic systems is actually they, they have to deal with open-ended problems. The environment that is changing in unpredictable ways or malfunctions that were not predicted by the, the, the engineer that set up the system. Now, what we are trying to do, just to give you an idea, consider this kind of robots that uh, are performing a simple task. It looks pedestrian, but what you have to look at this is these robots, they have a capacity to compute that is very small. So, so they work on batteries and so on. And what they are doing is actually to make a collective transport of this big object here, okay? And the rules are very simple. They are attracted for, to res, and then they grab the red ring, and at some point they will push it toward the light, or they will try to move toward the light. This has to be a collective uh, effort, because they, alone they don't have the strength to drive them. And so what you'll see is that with time, this guy will attach there and then will push it. Now imagine this thing with now, this would be what you would like these machines to do for you. Suppose that it was a much more interesting stuff than just transporting this, this thing. But now any little failure in a robot will prevent this thing to move, okay? And this, the ways in which any of these robots can fail is absolutely unpredictable, okay? There is no way that an engineer can fix this thing in a definitive way. So what we have been doing is to try to implement into these robots uh, an immune system that then can deal with these uh, open-ended, endless uh, failures, okay? And what we are doing is to put in these things, or actually for the moment in simulation, but to, to put these things to run uh, an immune system that is shared by the machines, okay? And so in, the, in there, you will have the variables that encode for multiple populations of lymphocytes that would be shared between them. The first thing that we tried, for example, is what you are comparing here is a simulation, and the, the, what these robots are doing is actually cleaning those things that are rare and being tolerant or not eliminating the things that are persistent and dense, okay? Now, what you see here is, a, is that same system, but now we, we are not allowing the immune system that is controlling all this to to be shared between the robots. And so there is a collective pattern here that it's able to generate something like a tolerance to those, that ring of dense objects, but here it's not working, okay? And it's not working because the immune system is not being shared by all the machines. So there is some state of, uh, let's call, selfhood that is emerging here and allowing the system to tolerate this ring. And if you do not allow that system to emerge, then you just get a full, uh, elimination of all these components. And what we are now trying to, to do is to have, actually, it will be fast, so it will have to have something like a robot set or a swarm of robots that are doing things like swarming, so which is basically to aggregate and so on. And then what you are seeing here, so this is the nominal behavior that you would have, and what we have put in is one object that is actually doing a random walk. The, this stops working properly, so it's like, simulating something which you would not have the right sensors, 
such that you would stop behaving, and then this machine just goes around blindly. And uh, what, what you see, the green and red colors, is that what we are seeing is the immune system being shared by all these robots, also the immune system inside that robot. And because it's being shared, that guy that is misbehaving is actually being flagged by the immune system and so on. Now, if you are the engineer of this, there's many things that you can do. If you, if you are interested in swarming, and if all these things, they would be doing swarming and going to f f uh, refill their, bat their batteries and this kind of stuff, what you would actually encode in there is actually, if you get an immune response, so if you become red flagged by the immune system, then you just stop moving. And so you don't charge your batteries and so on. And so in this way, we are trying to get this uh, system that is, it detects the anomalies in a way that is open-ended. So it's not the robot engineer that has put it in there, it's a system that in general will just cope with all anomalies that are in there. So as concluding remarks, to stick with time, so what I've made you a little introduction to the vertebrate immune systems and told you that it deals with an open-ended diversity of fast evolving pathogens and it does this through a somatic system of uh, adaptation where there is mutations in the selection of uh, lymphocytes. But this one, because it generates so much diversity, it actually opens the door for autoimmunity and destruction of the tissues by recognition by these random receptors, okay? And I told you that there is mechanisms that are very robust in preventing this autoimmune destruction, and this is done actually captured by the cross-regulation model that I've shown you with these re regulatory and effector T-cell populations that are evolving. And uh, that system captures the way the immune system actually discriminates what is self, so the, the body components that are persistent and abundant, and discriminates that from other, which are all the other components that are rare, but they are growing, okay? Now, the... If, if you want, so, so I didn't went much into that, but since I, I think I still have a bit of time. So, so self in here is not a genomic self in the sense that we're listening, it's not a genome of the, the thing, but for example, intestinal flora that is not invading you and not growing inside your body will become persistent and abundant and it will be tolerized, okay? And so this is a mechanism that actually ensuring symbiosis with organisms that are not deleterious by growing like crazy inside your body, okay? Now, the, and what I've shown you more is just I illustrated, put the two vignettes of how to, we are trying to actually take these principles of how the immune system manages to do this into robotic systems that deal with open-ended changes in the environment and with open-ended anomalies of the distributed robotic system. And so, just to terminate, I will just acknowledge the people that have done the work. So I've shown you some images of lymphocytes moving, and so that those were done in the group of Jocelyn de Manjou at IGC. I've shown you the a model that has, has been the work of a lot of people along the years, although I showed this just a simple simulation to illustrate it. And, uh, and I've shown you the, the models of the robot systems that were mainly done by Dinesh Tarapore in the collaboration with Pedro Lima and then Anders Lin Christensen, both in, uh, in Portugal, in Lisbon. And so if you are curious about this, just visit our website and uh, then you will get all the details of the papers in there, if you are, because we have all the papers online. And uh, this was basically, if you, if you want just a propaganda so that you can read the thing and give you just an outline of what is in there. Now, in an evolutionary biology or evolutionary patterns uh, conference, what the take home message that you should get from here is that is the immune system is actually an evolutionary adaptive system. So some of these questions that we are, you have been discussing of generation of variability, heredity, uh, persistence of uh, some patterns across generations, form, uh, is selection at the individual cell or is the selection at the groups of cells and this kind of stuff. You can actually play it in the immune system with a, quite a lot of detail because we have a lot of tools to do that, both in the modeling point of view, but also on the experimental point of view. So it might be an arena where you guys can try some of the concepts, okay? And so I'll terminate like this and uh, Thank you. How Thank do we you proceed very much. from here? <laughs> uh, you, you should come here. Okay. <laughs>